23 years ago today, if you will cast your minds back, on this same occasion, I gave the opening prayer in which I said, quote, we have met here today clothed in the black robes of a false priesthood. Now, many have asked me since then whether I really said such a shocking thing, but nobody has ever asked what I meant by it. Why not? Well, some knew the answer already, and as for the rest, we do not question things at the BYU. But... <laughs> well... Uh, there have been some things said about Brigham Young University by others. None of them are as painfully critical as what Nibley occasionally says. And the same goes for certain aspects of the church, institutionally speaking. He really is its gadfly critic. And Hugh, of course, is, is above the fray, not in the sense of his being esoteric uh, or, uh, or highly advanced, but likewise, I think, because his commitment is so visible and has been so pronounced and so repetitively stated that that's not even the issue. So then we get on to what is Hugh saying. Does he still talk so fast that no one can understand what he's saying? No one knows what he knows. And that, of course, also is a problem with knowing him. Sometimes I think I don't know him at all. I'm just grateful that Hugh Nibley, with his brilliance, wasn't buried somewhere in the Middle Ages in some monastic assignment that he would have performed with his brilliance. I'm grateful instead that he's been preserved to be here in the dispensation of the fullness of times when there could be a full flowering of his genius and his ability put at the disposal of the kingdom. And Hugh Nibley, in his field, would be the most remarkable scholar we have. He is so focused on the things that matter and is spiritually submissive that he's impatient with mediocrity, he's impatient with irrelevance, and to the casual eye, that may be seen as eccentricity, when in fact, I think it's a reflection of his deepened discipleship. No, you just have to take you for what he is and let him drift. Is he a cynic and a pessimist with all kinds of negative things to say? Yes. Is he an optimist, an idealist with great hope for the future? Yes. Some would say you can't get those together. He does. <laughs> I never have thought of myself as, as a participant, but always on the sidelines, always looking on, and always finding myself in a position where I rather could get a rather good look. But everybody's in that position if they just wanted to take it, realize what they were into. We're wandering around as strangers looking for things to recognize, and whenever you see something which you know is good, true, and beautiful, that's an act of recognition. And you recognize it as such, not by analyzing it, but it comes to your memory, it hits you, I've seen that, I know that's right, and so forth. Wait a minute. They've got it hidden around here somewhere. I want to see, just give me one little LC here and I'll be thankful. But no, they won't do it. Let's look for it. City, 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 city. City Fear Farasho. City. Yes, we know there's a city, but that's not the question. My entire falco, entire folk. The Farage. <laughs> Desperately searching for it, eh? This is the search for the hypocephalus. Let's see now. They just started to carve this, you see. They haven't done anything here. Don't see it there. Now let me see, is it here? We go here. I've got to look at the other wall here. That means we jump down a ways. Goodbye, I'll see you. <laughs> of the passionate pilgrim we could call it the puzzled pilgrim because <laughs> that's what I've considered myself as being a puzzled pilgrim going on a pilgrimage I wonder what the hell I'm looking at <laughs> my earliest memories is running away from home I remember that day when I was three and ran away I remember everything that happened that day because I was trying to figure it out I was determined I had to run away from her. I had to find out what was up up there 
Mr. Walker walked in, in, in 24th, 25th Street. It used to go up the hill there and then was in the distance and it was usually raining or something like that, but there would be a rainbow at Mount Hood or something. Uh, what? I would just ache to know what was up there. I just couldn't stand it any longer. I had to know what was beyond that street, you know. Uh, it just always seemed to be there, and he had this curiosity, the intense curiosity about everything, making telescopes in high school. In the middle of the night, I remember more than once, he wake me up at three in the morning and tell me that Venus or somebody was having an occlusion and I didn't care to see it particularly. I didn't give a hoot. I think I would show off how much I knew in this sort of thing. I was prone to show off. That's true. An insufferable little show off will say that. Hugh was always allowed to do his thing. We sort of worked around Hugh. Things moved around Hugh. I, I'm sure Mother arranged things around Hugh. When he was a child, he had a whole suite of rooms all to himself. He was given very special treatment, but she, he was her favorite, and uh, I think he suffered for it. Hugh's father tried to be a businessman like his father, uh, Charles W. Nibley. Charles W. Nibley was one of the richest and most successful businessmen in the church. He was a presiding bishop for many years and a counselor in the First Presidency. He had three wives and three families. Uh, was it you who were up in Logan the other day and saw that palace he built for one of his wives? He built these for his three wives, these palatial mansions. He didn't want them to, to grow up in poverty, his kids to grow up in poverty, and they didn't see the result. They were all spoiled rotten, had anything they wanted. And if they had to wait for money five minutes, they were furious and so forth and so on. And he enjoyed, he thoroughly enjoyed distributing it around. That's the only reason he wanted to make it, is so he could throw it around. He liked to see everybody happy. He thought that's the thing that would make them happy, and it certainly did put on a show. I always knew it was there. We could always joke about it and so forth, because my father, grandfather joked about it. He tried to laugh it off, you know, as you see in the letters. You know, he, talks, he talks playfully about filthy lucre and this, and the other. But uh, it really worried him considerably. I keep telling him your grandfather gave the church $500,000. You think it would have been better if he hadn't? He almost talks like a Franciscan. It'd be better if we were all poor. And he wouldn't be tempted to think God gave it to us and we can use it the way we want it. God didn't give it to us, and if he did honorably, then we'd better use it for him and not for our failing our own nest. Boy, he's tough on that. I think it was that last talk I had with Grandpa. And I went to see Grandpa Nibley, and that's when he died. He had a suite on the top floor of the Hotel Utah. He said, uh, do you see that window there? Considering the things he'd done in his life, he says, if an angel were to come through that door, I would jump right out that window. I wouldn't hesitate. He'd, I'd go right through that window, he said. He couldn't face an angel. You were talking about the, the culture shock of meeting an angel or so forth. And uh, that, was our, that was our parting conversation, our, the last words to him. And then we said goodbye and so forth, but that left it with me, you see. Here he was in the first presidency, had been presiding bishop for all those years, and yet he says now that he could not face an angel. It was because we'd been talking about it, because of the things he had to do in the way of business. So I don't have much choice. Money's never meant much of anything to you that I could see. That's the last thing you would think about. But this is the, the root of all evil, which I say is a very... Well, the word is philargaria. And philargaria does not mean love of money. Uh, we said, that, well, I don't actually love money. I'd like to have it. I want it and so on. I don't actually love it. But philargaria is simply desire to be rich. Philargaria is the, the desire for for money in the bank, we all, which we all have. And that's the root of evil. Do you have any money? Yes, we have sufficient for our needs. There's nothing wrong with having sufficient. But, he says, it's wanting more. That's the thing. Because more than enough is more than enough. If you don't need it, you don't need it. I mean, how, you could, how it could be clearer, I don't know. The mere ac accumulating it for the sake of accumulating it would simply wouldn't occur to him. He had no dislike of it. He just didn't think about it. It's a wonderful way to be, they say. I mean, people want things. They'll start wanting things, in other words. You start wanting things, and there's no end. And uh, you're tempted first. You must own this, and you must that. And then, of course, the Book of Mormon is beautiful. And then the rivalries and the bitterness and ending finally in murders and so forth. It builds up there. But the temptation and then the snare, you're caught in the, in the rapids and into many foolish desires for things. Well, lust, epithemia, is desire to possess something, lust after that's a good strong word in English. We associate it with sex. You see, that doesn't mean that. It means you, I've got to have that. I've set my heart on that. I've got to have a new, 
Mercedes or something like that. And those are foolish and they're hurtful. And I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. This is a parable, and uh, it's, I mean, it was an expression for impossibility. It's a Spruce word. For, for the impossible, uh, a camel through the eye of a needle is absolutely impossible, you see. And uh, the, the apostles are amazed at that, you see. They didn't know of any postern gate through which you went and so forth. The idea the rich man must shed his riches to go through the eye of the needle and this, that, and the other. It was, you see, he says it can't be done except by a special miracle from God, special dispensation. Notice, and when his disciples heard it, they were, notice, absolutely knocked over. They were astounded. They didn't know, as I say, of any other possible explanation. They really took it literally. It says here, it's a weak translation, but it says they were exceedingly amazed. They're absolutely astounded and bewildered that he would say it's impossible for a rich man to get into heaven, saying, who then can be saved? But you're not going to get into the kingdom of heaven or Zion on this earth. If you're encumbered with riches, it can't be done. This is the title that we came up with, but have you heard the story on what the original title was? No. I thought it would please him. It was going to be called Nibley, no, The Nibley Legacy. And I had it all mocked up, and I invited him to my house, and I had it on the coffee table. He comes up with Phyllis, and I say, there's the book. And I thought, you know, it's like announcing it with trumpets, and he would jump for joy. He just, oh, no, you can't do that. I, mean, I don't like it. It won't do. It's uh, and I said, why not? I said, well, for one thing, it sounds like I'm dead and gone, and I'm not. And, and for another thing, legacy, legacy, what does that mean? So I finally said, well, I'll call you tomorrow. Maybe we can brainstorm. In the meantime, I checked. And when I called him, I, I thought I had him. I said, Hugh, it's on the spine, it's on the cover, it's on the jacket, and it's on every page of the galleys. And if we change it now, it will cost $1,100. And I would say, okay, go ahead. You know what he said? It's typical nibbling. Change it and take it out of my royalties. And I gasped. And I said, Hugh, do you care that much about a title? He said, no, I care that little about royalties. trips with my father and up in the backwoods around Crater Lake and places like that. He was always up before dawn. He always saw two or three bears. Of course, we laughed at him because he was always seeing bears until I got up one morning, went up. First thing I did was run into a bear. So we figured that he saw the bears all right. I went up to to Crater Lake because we lived at Medford and I had always wanted to go back to Crater Lake and I spent six weeks or more than that there and I walked up through the Yumpqua Forest and I remember those times were very wild, no roads or anything, and bears all over the place and the like. Very naive, I'd read the, the Concord School and thought that all I had to do was go back to nature and I really believed that so I took a bag of wheat and some raisins and I lived on little red huckleberries and uh, got myself terribly sick on too much of these things, you know. He explored a lot around Crater Lake. I think he swam out to an island there that was in that ice water. I don't know why he did it, I guess, just because he enjoyed it. We went down and spent a weekend on the beach sleeping on the sand and listening to the seals bark all night long, and we would wander up and down the coast. And whatever he saw would sort of unwrap his tongue and he would start talking. You know, whether it was uh, a seashell or uh, a wave pattern or the color of the sand or whatever it was. If uh, Grandpa Nibley sees only the feet of timber in a forest, uh, that's all it is to him, he is not having a fullness of joy or the fullness of the earth. For example, in uh, 1925, I worked all summer in the Nibley Stoddard Lumber Company uh, in Cromberg. California in the Feather River. My job was on the bull chain. I had these big things to throw. It was, it was tough work all day long, 10 hours a day, six days a week. This bull chain, its purpose was to pile up, to burn all the excess lumber. Well, everything that wasn't absolutely square from the middle of the log, all that was trimmed off, sent down this bull chain, cut off into sections, 
take to the pile and burned. The whole thing is this enormous pile, burning day and night, this huge pile of timber. Of course, today, that would be worth millions, of course, all that, just as firewood, nothing else, but it was good. But they didn't bother to say it. They took the, the quickest possible profits from the redwoods. What did they take? Only the hearts of the redwoods for railroad ties. That was something, to see this destruction going on and so forth. Uh, like a murder and get gain. This was a form of murder. I mean, it's taking life of various sorts. Because remember, this is a doctrine we do not emphasize that we believe that all living things, you see, are spiritual beings too, and shall have the resurrection. We're told that. But this wanton business to pervert them. Remember the Mahan principle, I am master of this great secret that I can murder and get gain. But these things are to be enjoyed, and they want to be enjoyed, you see, legitimately. If you're fasting, you're not going to plunder, you're not going to waste, you're going to appreciate what's there. You're going to have a chance to enjoy it to the full and with cheerful hearts, countenances, and then, of course, the fullness, of, because we're missing the fullness of the earth if we don't do that. Then you consider the things to be thankful for, and you immediately become aware of the beauties of the world and the delights around you, the delights of nature and so forth, and the pleasures of the flesh that you can enjoy, merely breathing, merely drinking. Remember that marvelous character in, in Thomas Mann, the, the Zauberberg? Uh, Pete Peppercorn, the fabulously rich Dutchman who's looked for everything you could find, would bring delight, and finally he ends up with Dear Haben and Gaben des Lebens, the simple, noble gifts of life. He could take more joy in a glass of water than he could in a glass of the most uh, costly wine, you see. This is the simple Dear Haben and the noble, simple gifts of life. You say, well, uh, you find joy in those things, but only when you're fasting, only when you distract your mind from all this other trash and tripe and jungle and concern and impressions that are being made and what we look like and so forth. You forget all that when you fast, you see. Then you can really enjoy. Then you can really start enjoying everything about you and the whole situation. It becomes marvelous. And then the heavens declare the glory of God. You only become aware of that when you're fasting, when you're abstracting your mind from normal concerns. A very interesting thing happened when I was in Berkeley during, during a sabbatical. I was teaching there, and uh, one student came to his fellow. His name was Brown, a, a very fine young man. He had a problem, and this is the liberal Berkeley crowd, you know. How can I break the news to my parents that, they're really, that I really believe there was a God? <laughs> but here I'm not subversive. That's, I can get away with anything here because I can back it up with the scriptures. Here I can quote the scripture freely. I'm going to bring that in no matter what. This is the only place I don't have to apologize for. But even a school here teaching you, the teacher cannot teach you at all. He's there to save your time. And when you bear your testimony, that's what you do. You don't twist anybody's arm or force them to believe. Now, I believe, so you'd better believe or else. Well, that's utterly meaningless. <laughs> then in other words, and you're saying, well, then what good does it do to say I believe? How will that affect another person? Uh, it's the same way with the written word. Uh, it will, it will move some people very deeply and, of course, have no effect on others, or the mere understanding of the written word, which is a mystery after all. Nobody knows how that takes place. Writing itself is the most, as, as uh, Galileo says, the most marvelous device ever invented. There's no invention will ever approach writing for sophistication and the marvelous things it does. To transfer knowledge, the most delicate nuances of knowledge and feeling and emotion over thousands of years, through any distance in space, it beats any TV or anything else you could possibly devise. It's marvelous. And do that, he says, with 24, 26 simple, little simples, very simple designs. That does the whole thing. Now, what a marvelous thing that was. That's given by the finger of the Lord, you see. But to work it, you see, you have to know what's going on. You have to read into it. Unless you know what you're reading, you can't read it. I met him when he was at Cal in 1933. He was then a grad student. I forget what he was working on then, some absurd thing. One thing about him, he didn't give a damn for a degree. A university is nothing more nor less than a place to show off. And that's what they're doing. Everybody's consciously acting a role there. Everybody's after eminence. That's their objective. Their whole objective is eminence. They have nothing else to live for. It's the, it's the predicament of Faust, you see, in the opening act of Faust. There, Faust says, I said, Doctor, I said, my guester, uh, I'm called now master, I'm called even a doctor, and here I am, and I've been fooling people all these years. So Faust, the greatest, learnedest man in the world, decides there's nothing to do but commit suicide because it's a fake. The whole thing is a fraud. Well, that's when you bring the university and the scholarship and theology together. So the devil appears and he makes his bargain and so forth as a result. 
But when that, when scholarship is clothed in the in the robes of authority and, and that, that's why they're the black robes of a false priesthood, you see. But uh, there's no such thing as having an education at all. No, education, that means a formal line of training, that, that there's such a thing as a terminal degree, you have an education, that's not absurd. It's all becoming business and law now. Well, that's it, now that's the thing to do. And so that's what an education is. But that's not where your learning and knowledge really comes from. It's the gospel of repentance, and it's progressive repentance. Wherefore, you shall repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. And forevermore, it's a progressive repentance to realize where your weakness is. Now, that's a humiliating process, which one people can't put up with. It's a progressive revelation of your own ignorance as you go on to solve a problem. The great Scaliger, for example, the greatest scholar who ever lived, when he was learning Hebrew, he went to the ghetto, uh, and the children made fun of him, correcting his Hebrew, which is very crude, you see. And the scholars wouldn't speak to him. They were indignant. He was willing to humiliate himself and become as a little child, see. Unless you become as a little child, you're not intelligent, you see. You're stupid. And that's what they blocked it because their, their haughtiness, their pride, and that pride is stupidity, is what it is. But I've noticed that all along. Because as students, we were so blessedly ignorant, so horribly ignorant, and uh, the teacher was, he, you, you, get, you declared a PhD when you still don't know anything, but from then on you go on teaching and you, you begin to pontificate from that moment. But you still don't know anything, you see. No matter how, uh, how sharply you focus on a particular object or how highly you specialize, you miss most of it, no matter what it is. So that no person has the same uh, experiences or reactions as the others. You see a different thing. Everyone's seeing is selective, and mine has been, you see. I select certain things and completely bypass others uh, to an astonishing degree. I think if you live right and keep your mind open, if you ask for, for revelation and so forth and your mind is open, you will receive uh, uh, hints and proddings that are stronger than just normal insights and things like that, things that are very strong sometimes. The one thing that he has that I would give anything to have is the gift of absolute faith. He has it. And this you can't acquire. You either have it or you don't. He has it and I don't. We used to talk about that in terms of Faust. You know that famous line, Die Botschaft höre ich wohl, allein mir fährt der Glaube. I hear the message well, but I don't have the faith. Did you always have a testimony of the gospel? Uh, except for one short period, when the bottom of the world fell out, that was desperate. But uh, when was, was that it quickly, thing? it came back with a bang. And, uh, I was terribly bothered about uh, this afterlife business and that sort of thing. I have no evidence for that, whatever. And I remember I went up to Mount Wilson at that time. I walked around in the snow and brooded about it, and then I came back. We had a meeting of the old Hollywood ward. Matthew Cowley's father was the speaker that night. He said, I want to meet Brother Cowley, and as soon as he took my hand, he says, come with me. I want to give you a blessing. The blessing was, a thing had been puzzling my mind. The Lord would give me an answer immediately. Within the week, I had an, an appendicitis attack, and so I, we went to the old Seventh-day Adventist hospital out in Loma Linda and uh, had the appendix taken out. As I understand, he swallowed his tongue and uh, actually uh, was at one time technically dead. And, uh, of course, they realized what had happened, worked frantically to... and. Uh, brought him back but during that period he had one of these life after death experiences very much like the ones that Dr. Moody describes then all of a sudden down this thing like a tube you know you get sucked down this thing and you come out of the oh boy I know everything everything is there and everything this is what I wanted to know three cheers and all this sort of thing and I started solving problems and everything else and then they found the resuscitator, and the doctor says, I talked to him all during the operation. I said, just because I can't move now, it looks as if I wasn't feeling this, but it hurts so much worse than I can describe. It's real, all right. And I talked with him the whole time during that thing, and Dr. Whalen talked about that. He said, I've never seen anybody do anything like that. But it, all, I, all I wanted was to know whether there was anything on the other side. And when I came out there, I didn't meet anything or anybody else, but I looked around, and not only was in all possession of my faculties, but they were... Tremendous. I was light as a feather and ready to go, you see. And uh, above all, I was interested in problems. Uh, I'd missed out a lot of math and stuff like that. How would be able to go? Well, five minutes I could make up for that. Remember, as, as Joseph Smith said, if you could look for five minutes into yonder heavens, you see, 
forget all the rest you ever bothered about. So that gives me a great relief. So that's why I don't take this very seriously down here. We're just sort of dabbling around, playing around, being tested for our, our moral qualities and above all, the, the two things that we can be good at and no two other things can we do. We can forgive and we can repent. It's the gospel of repent. So we're told that the angels envy men their ability both to forgive and to repent because they can't do either, you see. But nobody's very clever, nobody's very brave, nobody's very strong, nobody's very wise. We're all pretty stupid, you see. Nobody's very anything. We're not tested in those things. But the things the angels envy us for, we can forgive and we can repent. So three cheers. Let's start repenting as of now. Oh, I can remember very clearly one day he had a huge steamer trunk which was filled with with um, shoe boxes which contained his note cards. And he was going through this and either filing or setting them up somehow. And mother said, what on earth are you doing that for? He says, oh, I'm just getting ready. I'll be going to war. This was some years before the war broke out. But he had, uh, he had sized that up pretty early. My first assignment, it was so typically army, you must hear about it. It was the eve of Thanksgiving. <laughs> and I was scrubbing toilets out with a big brush, with a big scrubbing brush. I was busy scrubbing these latrines out and so forth. And an officer came to me, said, come with me and bring the brush. So I said, come with me and bring the brush. It was a huge pile of celery. They were preparing it for the officer's mess the next day. He says, clean this celery off. I said, but this brush, I just use it for cleaning toilets. That doesn't make any difference. He said, look shiny and clean. That's the arm. That's all we want to know. So there I was cleaning that celery for the officers the next day for their Thanksgiving dinner with a toilet brush. That's so typically army. I mean, it's marvelous, you know, and it goes, goes on. Camp Ritchie was set up to train people for intelligence service, G2 service. There never were more than, I think, 11 or 1,200 people at the top. We were in the same class in Ritchie, and this was the German class. There's Hugh Nibley himself in the third row, the second person from the left. But they were all these famous men, lots of great musicians, artists, and so forth. That's where I met Lucien. I would think that I, on the whole, was more optimistic about uh, the president and some of the intentions than Hugh Nibley might have been. He was often pessimistic. He altogether regarded that we were at the end of the times and that uh, more disasters were ahead of us. Hugh Nibley decided that he would not like to be an interrogator. The idea of pressing others, soldiers, who were under orders not to reveal information and to press them to reveal it seemed morally unpleasant to him. He therefore went into that section called order of battle in which the purpose was to know what forces we're facing any one of the sections of our army. Now, OB teams were to be attached only to army groups. That was as high and as safe as you could get, with one exception. So when we were in London, we received our assignments. I remember Wagner came out. We was up on the top floor late at night on the, uh, the British uh, war office there. And they had a special wooden structure built up there because they didn't have enough space. In this little dark hall, we were standing there waiting for the judgment. And, and, and um, Brown went in. He was our lieutenant spoke with a very thick German accent. He went in to get the assignments. They were going to give the assignments to all of them. And we were it. We were the one who would not be attached to Army Group. We would be attached to the 101st Airborne and be the first to land in Normandy. We'd be the very first. And, of course, men who had been waiting for 20 and 30 years for war to get into, you see, were just itching for it. It was the happy war. It was the chance to get fast promotions. It was the big time. It was the chance for heroics. It was the chance to get a, a big command. Above all, it was the chance to see battle. And all oh, they were men, officers, just reveled in it because it was their life's career. I'll tell you, if there was anything that puzzled me all the time I was there, I would say, huh? what on earth am I doing here? Why was I ever put in this situation? I felt I was just an observer. Why am I being shown this awful stuff? I don't want to see it. It was utter waste, but the wrongness of what we were doing was so strong that uh, everybody would cry. People would cry. They would weep. They would tears would stream out. They, 
the wrong in this thing. It was so utterly, unspeakably sad. It wasn't terrifying, but it was so sad you could hardly stand it. People would do such things to each other, you see. Yes, it's a lonely beach. It was a good place to land, I suppose. Un unexpected. But they knew all about it. The first ones that came out, they said, but wait a minute, what happened? We thought you were going to come yesterday. But they missed on the time, and they didn't think you'd be insane enough to come in the weather. And they never thought we'd land at the various places we did, because neither did we. It was accidental, blown all over the place. Oh, the stories they told after, the places they were landed in, the, and the complete confusion everywhere, which confused the enemy as much as it confused us, and so forth. They said they'd never had a storm like that since the day World War I began. I remember the day World War I broke out. I was four years old, but I remember it vividly. My father coming in reporting so far. I remember the day it ended exactly. Meantime, we played in muddy lots. We played soldier. And when I found myself in the mud in France, it was the very same thing. And again, when we make our operations, our, our drills, our CPX is on the British coast, here were these gun emplacements, but they had been Roman fortifications. They were gun emplacements made for the invasion of Napoleon. And here we were manning the same things for the same war. We hadn't moved since the time of the Romans, the same thing. So I'm convinced to see that I've seen one war, two wars, and I'll probably see three. We haven't learned a thing. And this is a thing that impressed me more than anything else, why I can't get excited or sentimental about the whole operation of World War II. The word that kept in my head more than anything else was silly. It was utterly silly. It was needless, it was silly, they never had to give Hitler all that power, fortunately he was, if he hadn't been insane, he could have pushed us back into the sea with the greatest of ease. But uh, the whole thing was silly, unnecessary, uncalled for, as the next war will be. I had a full year of preparation for this operation, and it was all carefully planned and knew perfectly well. It was so intermeshed, so carefully coordinated, just as they say, the elaborate plans for nuclear war, this will happen and this will happen, then we'll plan how we can control it. Well, they couldn't control anything. First place, the weather. They, they couldn't move on the 5th, they had to move on the 6th. That threw everything out for us, but it saved our lives because the Germans were expecting us on the 5th. But nothing worked. Everything went, went foul here. People being landed on the wrong beach, the wrong things being landed at the wrong time and so forth. All sorts of confusion, not getting the things you wanted. So this idea that we can carefully plan it, that we have the intelligence to manage it or the character to control events is utterly absurd. Man is nothing. As the Book of Mormon says, how great is the nothingness of man. And Moses said, I hadn't supposed that before, but it's true, I am nothing. And King Benjamin, when he says we're less than the dust, means get down there and realize what you are. But we don't, we're very proud and arrogant. We still are, we, we have the power, we have the might, we can, Tell people what to do and they'll do it, especially certain people in Washington feel that very, very strongly, as you know. Why are we so benighted? Why is Israel so small? Why is all except the Lord's solution so small? Because, not only because they, they want it that way, but remember, Israel itself rejected the Lord. In every dispensation, they do not seek him. They could find him instantly if they sought him. Remember, Abraham was the only one, we're told, for ten generations who sought after the Lord. And as we're told in the second chapter of the book of Abraham, thy servant has sought thee diligently, now he has found thee. So there's good news and bad news, as there always has been. There's always been bad news. There's good news is here. The gospel is here. Bad news, people aren't going to accept it. See? It's going to be rejected. <laughs> and that's it. They go on together. But... As many, beginning of John, remember, but as many as received it, he gave power to become sons of God. See, that is the big issue. That is Israel. That is the peculiar people. That is set apart, isolated, and so forth. He gave them power to become sons of God, to move into a totally different sphere, a totally different life. And how many people were willing to do that, and how many people were able? Remember, the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. been a ritualist, that is a man who not only sees that one way to study cultures is to look at their rites, R-I-T-E-S, but in addition is convinced that somehow these rites tie in to the ideas of the temple and finally even to the foundations of civilization. Egypt seems to be the capital or the center related to many other cultures, both temporally and spatially. The Egyptians realized, as we do, that all life comes from the sun. 
its energy reaches us most immediate sensation is light and if you're in Egypt you know how the sun dominates the picture light and life are literally inseparable that's a scientific fact of our own day the light of the world is the life of the world as the scriptures tell us here we are in the dark mysterious passages beneath the Egyptian temples but they are still places of joy and we've got the joy symbols here just in coming down the final step here is the picture of the sun disk sending down in its rays from heaven, as it says, even to this dark place. Who wants to plunge into a dark underworld and leave this all behind? And only Egyptians, I say, were honest enough to recognize that that alone is the fundamental question. The oldest written text in the world is here. We do not start out with primitives uttering a lot of mumbo jumbo and uh, dancing around and practicing cannibalism and so forth. This is a very highly developed doctrine. There's only one older text of it, and that is from the, uh, the Shabako Stone. Well, here we are at the end of the journey, and we learn that it is not the end. Just as the end of the door, we've been told, he says, the priests sing, he has come here to be purified, he has come here to be purified. And then they break out into a hymn of praise and joy. Anikif, Anikif, when is pen, Anik? He lives, he lives, this Wenis lives, he does not die, and Temef, and Temef, he does not die, Wenis does not die, this Wenis does not die, and Sekhef, he does not pass away, and Hephef, he is not covered over, after all, he may be here, but he is not covered over, Yunus is not covered over, he is going on and on, and finally we get to the end, and here, from this it's clear that he has completed all the ordinances, they say to him, Pesher and Ech Yirtu, Thou hast the Yatu, thou hast circumambulated the holy ceremonial centers. I wrote a study on that, I know what I'm talking about there. Finally, he says, you are reinstated, complete. Or this displays the Egyptian love of multiple meanings. The various members of the body are those of Atom, the creator God, or they even are Atom. The Egyptians love punning, and I believe that M. Temet can mean completed or a perfect thing. In this case, the, the legs are completely restored. It's a perfect passive participle. Your face, your head, then, it, then just the tongue down here is complete. So he's physically reinstated. Everything is taken care of. He is now ready to leave, and he doesn't stay long. The positivism of modern science has obsessed us with this idea that the Egyptians are beset with this morbid preoccupation with death, the gloom, and the tomb. The grisly mummy image, you know, that we've got with the Egyptians, and nothing could be farther from the truth resurrection not death is the theme here look at this man he's striding forth with purpose and gladness his eyes looking forward the hands above his head are raised in the ka gesture which is the salute to the spirit moving into the higher world the upper world is the ka you see when you enter the presence of a great one you raise both hands to show that you're not armed also that you bear no ill will and that you trust him completely he's coming into the presence of the father you always call him the father with complete trust and confidence you see and that's followed by the chet or the embrace. Then you embrace him and you become one with him. You become his son. I have friends that say not only that they don't believe on such absurdity, but they don't believe for a minute that I believe on it. They say you can't believe on anything so silly. It's so far away and we've got so far away from that. But when you're close to it, I mean it becomes an obsession. What would you rather have? Would a man not give everything, you see, to have a, to have a complete life, I mean abundant life and live forever. The, what is the greatest of gifts? It's eternal life. Well, we say there's no such thing. Well, they say there is, and of course you're obsessed with eternal life. If there's a chance for it, you take, you do everything. And I think it's important that we have these records and go back to these early times to get us off dead center. What would she, what should we be looking for? Remember, first Nephi ends with four things. There are four things we should never look for. The first thing is gain, the second is power, the third is popularity, and the fourth is uh, the lusts of the flesh, it says. Those are the things, and they all go together. And those are the things everyone's looking for. Those are our objectives. When you say, well, what should be our objectives? Ah, Abraham, book of Abraham, the second, that second verse says, what I, Abraham, what he was after, what he wanted. But now here's what he's after, greater happiness and peace and rest from me. So he seeks for the blessings of the fathers and the right whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same, having been myself a follower of righteousness. Now, obviously, he is in on a tradition. We're dealing here 
with a sort of closed circle. Every time we mention these things, remember, we're dealing with a close. You have to be an initiate. You have to be inside. These things can't be treated lightly. They have to be taken seriously. You see, the great emphasis on Israel is that it's a holy people set apart. The word peculiar, sigil, is the word they use, which strongly resembles the Latin sigil, to be sealed. A sealed people, peculiar, set apart, reserved to me. The Lord uses those expressions all along. You're supposed to be absorbing as many into you as you can. You're supposed to be going so eventually you will suck in the whole world. And at each particular stage, the knowledge is limited to those who will receive it. Wherever we look in these Egyptian monuments, the king has to follow one thing, mat, righteousness, mat, righteousness, justice, fairness, honor, a stable social order, things as they should be. We would say the two things that cover everything are that the beloved son who is full of grace and truth. You see, truth, there's nothing false about it, but grace is there's nothing negative about it. Self-interest, uh, ulterior motives, scheming, gaining, trying to get ahead, influence, power gain, none of that. Grace is the very opposite of that. It's charis. Our word cheer is also related to it. Also the Greek charis, Latin gratia. Gratia means thanks. It means a free gift, a gift you don't ask anything in return for. You feel that way, just as we give things to children, not for what they can do for us, but because of love, you see. So grace is, the tendency, of course, is to render it in new translations as love, which is right. So grace and truth, and this is Abraham, right from the beginning here, when he says, where, I mean, a follower of righteousness, this is, this is righteousness, this is your God. Desiring also to be the one to possess greater knowledge, always he wants to possess great knowledge, and then he wants a greater knowledge, too. Here's where we draw the line, you see. We don't think that's so important. We've lost interest in knowledge today. It's a very interesting thing. We want power, recognition, and things like that. But knowledge, for its own sake, doesn't excite us very much. It's surprising how many students will say, don't tell us something we don't already know. Uh, I used to have students come up indignantly and say to me after class, Brother Nibby, I've never heard of that before. Of course, of course, that's why you're here because you've never heard of that before. But no, they just want to be told, give the same standard routine testimony and so forth. Desiring to be one who possess great knowledge and to be a greater follower of righteousness. Notice there's your, your gospel of repentance. To be a greater follower, he's not doing well enough. He wants, never doing well enough. Always to be, a, like the man Adam, he is ever seeking more light and truth, or more light and knowledge, either one, you see. Abraham not only had to take his wisdom to the Egyptians, but he had to acquire wisdom from them. This was the going concern. This was the center of uh, not just the intellectual, but the spiritual center of the world at the time. Abraham has to hack in, to use that expression now, on the whole world of his time, because he is the father of the faithful, and it's going to, going to spread everywhere. He had to know the world, and the best place to get in on the ground floor was certainly Egypt. So he did, and we have to do the same sort of thing. Thanks to this prolonged drought that was on the world, it's testified from literature in all directions there, the religious observances had degenerated into rites of desperate and bloody nature to make the waters run, to bring prosperity, to bring fertility to the land and so forth. It was a time of famine. Remember, the whole story of Abraham, the background, the first of the labors of Abraham, the plagues of Abraham was famine. Abraham made himself very unpopular. For that reason, uh, he would be an ideal uh, substitute for the king for the sacrificial rites. The king was responsible for the prosperity and fertility of the land as, it, as he was for the victory of the army. When those failed, he was supposed to be put to death. Even when they didn't fail, every 30 years at the said festival, he had to be put to death, supposedly to renew his strength. But uh, he uh, found a substitute, and there's a lot said about these substitutes. And we're told that Abraham went through this routine too that he was rescued at the last minute, rescued by an earthquake. The moment he is rescued, the angel takes him up to heaven. And then the angel shows him a picture. He draws the whole thing for him on this round picture and points it out to him and says, when you get back to earth, you make a duplicate of that, you see. Well, he shows him this diagram of the cosmos, and it looks like our facsimiles. And of course, we see in it the, the hypocephalus, what it is. Then Pharaoh ordered all his court. 365 nobles to bring their children to the court and had Abraham sit on the throne and teach them about the sun and the stars. See? And so it says here, facsimile three, where Abraham, seated upon the throne of Pharaoh, is discoursing upon the, the heavens. 
Now here's an interesting thing. That figure on the throne is Osiris. Well, of course he's Osiris. He has to be. Abraham would have to be Osiris in that capacity. And uh, he is the king. Uh, but how it begins, it begins with the figure one. Osiris is lying on the couch. And he cries out, come to my aid and rescue me. When he reaches the depths at the last extremities, he cries out, and then the, the angel of the Lord comes to deliver him. Now, this is Horus, you'll notice. He is the Horus hawk, and always the son of Osiris is Horus. Horus comes in the form of a hawk and rescues him and takes him up, and he delivers him, and, uh, and then he, th he takes him on a guided tour through the heavens. And before you receive your final throne, you have this tour of the universe, and you see all this stuff, and then... You, and then in the final scene, you mount the throne. And this is what you do. You, you come out in glory. And, and so this is the theme and is exactly, of course, the sequence that we follow in the Pearl of Great Price. Similes 1, 2, and 3 in that order. And so at the great temple of Dendara, you find way up on the roof the resurrection complex. And there, what do you find but the themes of this Osiris myth? A sacrifice, a revelation of the cosmos, followed by coronation. It began with the drama of the passion or the sacrificial death of Osiris. But the hawk is bestirring him here. But here you notice, instead of him on the lion couch, is the disc arising, but it's not the solar disc. It's the heparu, which means he's changing his form now, preserving his identity, but changing his form and rising up. That is the symbol of transformation and ascension, both. He's got to rise. He has to make an astral journey here. These are astral figures, you know, there are stars strewn all through here. And here he's in the... Notice, here is the king. He is striding through the heavens with the bull, with the Kabul, with now a star between his horns. That's, that's probably the, the constellation of Taurus. But notice here the two heavenly ships, as you'll find on all the hypocephala, because they represent passing through the heavens. You've got to have that part with the... These go, in other words, right with the lion couch. The facsimile two should go with the facsimile one. You can't do, you can't separate the cosmic functions from the resurrection and from the burial. So what do you do when you make the transition from here? You pass through the cosmos. So this is when he passes from the one to the other. He passes through the universe, and this is the record that's left. These are the signs of the zodiac as we recognize them. We recognize the ram, the bull, the heavenly twins. But see, in this this context of being resurrected and passing through the heavens. They're very, they're very cosmic conscious. They're cosmic, they're conscious of the cosmos all the way through. And you notice the two boats facing each other, the Manjet bark and the Mescatet bark, the morning bark and the evening bark, the cycle of time and the sun. So here we have the hypocephalus motifs between what? Between facsimile one, it's facsimile two, next facsimile three is coronation. Now we emerge directly from the passage room with the celestial room, the passage through the kingdom, the passage through the cosmos rather, not the celestial, to a coronation. We would say facsimile number three. This is the king on his throne and all of these are typical coronation figures celebrating him, endowing him with the things he needs and so forth. After passing through the cosmos, our hero, be it Abraham or someone else, now sits on the throne of Pharaoh and is endowed with his power. And notice he's holding, he is holding, of course he has to hold, the, uh, the insignia of justice and judgment, the flail and the hook, and he's been hailed as the living king. Therefore, these are the mysteries of Osiris. See, they're taught him, and they include the greatest mystery of all is what comes after life. See, that's what they want to know. But the main idea is, you see, we're talking about this making connections and, and hacking in or getting into the circuit and so forth. These temple ordinances and things, they put you into an eternal, to a different order of things, and which the world will not understand. And if you try to make them vulgarized down here and treat them as, as if they belong to this universe of discourse, then you spoil them. But you have this general sense now, you see, of working ourselves into a much larger universe of discourse. We have been very localized here, and Joseph Smith's had a mind as broad as all eternity. And he introduced us into all of this, and then we immediately, our first reaction is to flinch and draw back. We say, well, let's go back to, to tithing in the word of wisdom, and, and that's the story. It's a mystery because it's not known to the, the world we see around us. It is a mystery in that sense, but it shouldn't be a mystery to you.
You're free to go as far as you want, and it's entirely up to you. We're all still qualifying as Osiris's as far as that goes. We must do the works of Abraham. And then we're told specifically in the Doctrine and Covenants, that means sacrificing, if necessary, your own life. Abraham was willing to do that, and everyone at some time or other will have the opportunity to show that he'd be willing to do that. Remember, we're told that Abraham was tested to the last extreme, to the ultimate extremity, as we're told in the Doctrine and Covenants. <laughs> Unless you're willing to give everything, you cannot claim eternal life. It's not to be cheaply bought. These are the great blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and must be brought. They must be willing even to give life itself and so forth. That's just a story that's told in the Midrash. It begins with Abraham sitting in the door of his tent in the plain of Mamre in the heat of the day. Now, this was a hot day, you see. This is what inspired the story, probably. It was a hot day. It says it was the day like the breath of Gehenna, like the breath of hell was coming out. And we, you can see the kind of country it was and is when this... This is so, the heat and the dust and the sand, the us, utter desolation. And he was worried, of course, because he, he says some poor stranger might be lost out there. Someone might have lost his way and uh, be perishing because you're not going to last higher than this. So he sent his faithful servant, Eliezer, out to look everywhere. He sent him out in all directions. He came back. No, I can't find anyone anywhere. He was still worried. He says there might be someone out there. And you, you have these feelings, so he, he went out himself, though he was very sick at the time. He was sick and ailing and old, and he went out and into that hell. And he looked and searched, but he found no one. And at the end of the day, he came back exhausted toward his tent. As he approached the tent, the three strangers were standing there. It was the Lord and the two with him, because the Lord goes with his counselor, so to speak. He throws himself down on his face. And then it is that he promises him Isaac <laughs> as a reward for what he had done. The Suprema. It's a very moving story. He'd gone out to look for his fellow man and out in that dusty hell, you see, all, all along. Eliezer couldn't find him. He said, I think I can find something. Well, he found something. He found the answer to the thing he'd prayed for all his life. His son, Isaac. Yeah. It's a beautiful story. But it's the desire of Abraham was that through him, his people and all mankind should be blessed. This Abraham, who towers like a colossus, is every man, as every man should be. In this world, remember what the Lord promised the apostles, in this world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. <laughs>